Coming up on today's episode of Airborne, the NTSB issues a preliminary report from the accident involving a young Eagles flight. The FAA gets more requests for UAV exemptions, and the first TACNAM P-2006T MRA aircraft is now operating in South Africa. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The NTSB has issued a preliminary report of an accident that fatally injured two people during a Young Eagles flight on September 27th. The report added some specific details and confirmed what had previously been reported by ANN. The accident involved a Cessna 172 Skyhawk and an experimental progressive Aerodyne Sea Ray. The Cessna 172 pilot and passenger were killed in the accident, while the Sea Ray made a successful emergency landing, resulting in minor injuries. Preliminary radar information provided by the FAA revealed that both airplanes were assigned discrete transponder codes. The data depicted both airplanes traveling westbound on roughly the same ground track. As the Cessna approached the Sea Ray from the east, it descended slowly to 1,625 feet. At the same time, the Sea Ray climbed slowly to 1,625 feet. Radar contact with the Cessna was suddenly lost in the vicinity of the accident site, while a descending right turn was depicted for the Sea Ray. The 1045 weather observation at Buffalo International Airport, about five miles west of the accident site, included clear skies, calm winds, and 10 miles visibility. Bring on the drones! Following ANN's recent report that six TV and film production companies will be allowed to fly UAV aircraft, the FAA has received more than a dozen new applications for exemption to its UAV prohibition. It's reported that there have been 57 applications for relief from the UAV ban this year. Jim Williams, manager of the FAA's Office of Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration, said there were only 40 applications when the six were approved for motion picture work late in September. Williams said at a recent industry conference that the FAA still hopes to have proposed rules for UAV flights published by the end of the year. He said he's working closely with the UK to learn about their experiences in the rulemaking process. He also said that the exemption does not allow the film and television companies to use their aircraft without specific authorization, and that would apply to any other company that is given permission for commercial use of a UAV. After these messages, we learn about a lightweight maritime surveillance aircraft entering service. You're watching Airborne. ADSB will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States. But you can benefit from ADSB today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADSB out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer. Get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com. Welcome back. If you have a story suggestion for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The first TACNAM P-2006T multi-sensor reconnaissance and identification aircraft, known as MRI, is now in operational service. CSS Tactical has entered into a joint agreement with the Indra Company of Spain for the marketing, selling, operating, and maintaining of the P-2006T MRI system in several countries in the African region. Developed by Indra, the Technam MRI aircraft has been specifically developed to patrol those maritime zones currently kept under surveillance by Coast Guards, utilizing medium-sized helicopters and large maritime patrol aircraft in particular. 
The Tacnam P2006 T is powered by two four-cylinder Rotax 912 S3 engines, delivering 100 horsepower each. 53 gallons of fuel provide six hours of flying time with a cruise speed of 130 knots. It's Friday at last, and that means it's time for our weekly barnstorming commentary. Jim has often complained about the quality of leadership in the aviation community, but here are just a few of the reasons why he's starting to feel encouraged. Here's this week's barnstorming. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Yeah, we complain a lot. Yeah, we point at things that we think are wrong, and sometimes we gotta get really critical. But the fact of the matter is there's plenty out there to be celebrated. There's plenty to point at and say, hey, this is going well. And there are a lot of people doing great work. And now and then I need to get off my high horse and recognize the fact that there are really extraordinary folks out there that have done a phenomenal job under hard circumstance and get away from criticizing those who aren't and start talking about those who are. We really have a richness, especially in the, mid, the smaller and mid-level associations and organizations in this industry, of extraordinary talent. We've long talked about the abilities and the incredible staff and management of the Aircraft Electronics Association. We've talked in bits and pieces also about women in aviation and what Peggy Cherian has done with not just an organization, but boy, I'll tell you what, you go to the event and if you could bottle whatever it is that they're bringing to that event and put it out to the rest of the industry, our problems would be over overnight. That does not happen by accident. It happens with exceptional leadership, with a great staff, and with a tremendous organization. But there's a lot of other organizations out there doing phenomenal work. You look at the entire Air Care Alliance, all the things that are happening through the angel flights and the planes and paws and the veterans airlifts and all the things that are going on out there. It's run by a guy out in New Mexico by the name of Raul Murrow, who also runs the Wolf Aviation Fund. He's got an extraordinary group of people backing him up and working with him and helping him to make sure that the best and brightest of aviation is putting its best foot forward and helping people in need and using airplanes and helicopters and all kinds of aviation goodies to show the world that aviators have a heart, a big one as a matter of fact. It's funny, we've been doing an awful lot of talking with the small and mid-level associations and you'll hear about that a bit more in a couple of weeks or so. But some of the conversations I've had have been really extraordinary. I've had a great conversation with the folks at the Seaplane Pilots Association. I heard enthusiasm. I heard optimism. I heard excitement. I heard really great ideas. I speak quite a bit now with the folks at the Commemorative Air Force, uh, especially Adam Smith. They've got great ideas. They're looking forward to tremendous things and preserving, explaining, educating, and promoting the history of this nation. We've been working a lot lately with the Academy of Model Aeronautics, who's really on the hot seat because so many of their members are flying vehicles that the FAA is kind of trying to push into a UAV definition. And the AMA is doing some extraordinary work in making sure that their interests, both the hobbyists and the pseudo-hobbyists, are recognized and that model aircraft for, you know, let's face it, so many of us started with model aircraft. They may be one of the most important associations in the entire aviation universe when it comes to the future of aviation. These guys are doing it right and we're in really, really good shape. We've worked a long time with SAFE, the Society of Aviation and Flight Educators. It's run by an exceptional guy by the name of Doug Stewart. He's got a great group of people with him. I could go on and on, and I probably will if you give me the chance, and Ashley will cut me off in a minute. We have extraordinary talent. Why don't we hear more from them? Because, well, they're not the 600-pound gorillas. Something needs to change. We have some ideas about that. You'll be hearing about it. But in the meantime, to all of you fighting the good fight, trying hard, who may not be running the 600-pound gorilla of associations and organizations, we're with you. We appreciate you. We thank you for your work. And more important, we're impressed as all get out. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. Airbus has patented a device it says will help its airplanes avoid bird strikes. The device is designed specifically for aircraft and is described as a device for acoustically scaring avian species. According to reports, the object of such a device is to repel avian species from sensitive zones of human activity by generating acoustic signals. We believe the non-engineering description of this is 
Loud noises scare birds. The patent drawings show several components installed on board an airplane that would generate noise intended to keep birds away from the aircraft. After the break, the space shuttle hangar gets a new tenant. Redbird Flight Simulations is dedicated to revolutionizing flight training by designing, manufacturing, and delivering affordable and innovative flight training technologies. Each Redbird device is designed to enhance the training experience for pilots of all levels, from student to ATP. Redbird is quickly becoming the industry standard for flight training. Since Redbird introduced its revolutionary FMX in 2007, colleges, universities, and flight training operations around the world have integrated Redbird products into their curriculum. It's time to discover what Redbird can do for you. Join the migration. Welcome back. NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida has entered into an agreement with the U.S. Air Force's X-37B program for use of the center's orbiter processing facility, referred to as the OPF, to process the X-37B orbital test vehicle for launch. The OPF Phase 1 and 2 were last used during NASA's Space Shuttle program. With the agency's transition to the Space Launch System rocket, and Orion spacecraft, the agency currently does not have a mission requirement for the facilities. In addition to vehicle preparation for the launch, the X-37B program conducted testing at Kennedy Shuttle Landing Facility to demonstrate that landing the vehicle at the former shuttle runway is a technically feasible option. The Boeing company is performing construction upgrade in the OPFs on behalf of the X-37B program. These upgrades are targeted to be complete in December. A passenger on a JetBlue flight getting set for departure from Philadelphia International Airport earlier this week reportedly found herself being removed from the plane after she posted information on Twitter about the pilot undergoing a sobriety check. After another passenger reportedly accused the pilot of being drunk, the airline said in a statement that, quote, as a precautionary measure, a sobriety test was conducted. The test demonstrated the pilot was sober and he was clear to perform his duties, end quote. According to a report, Lisa Carter Knight Sin was posting that information on Twitter to her family and friends. She said the pilot of the plane asked that she be removed from the flight, which had been delayed by the sobriety test. It makes you wonder how the pilot knew she had tweeted. Did a little birdie tell the pilot? Well, that's our program for October 10th. Remember to get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. Remember, Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. And you can join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new edition. And please remember, the next generation of Airborne will be unveiled right after New Year's. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.